So thanks everyone uh, for joining. It's, in the, it's indeed a great pleasure for me to be here today at one of the episodes of uh, Tech for Dreaming. And with this presentation, I'm going to walk you through our uh, open source dream engineering toolbox, which is called Dreamento, and also an introduction to our upcoming lucid dreaming induction study with uh, wearable EEG systems. But before getting into the main topic, let's start with a bit of uh, introduction about basics of sleep. We as humans spend one third of our lives sleep. Uh, during sleep, despite the paucity of behavior, our brain stays active and exhibits a wide range of coupled brain oscillations. The gold standard to study sleep is polysomnography. Uh, during a polysomnography measurement, various by signals such as EEG, EOG, and EMG are being measured. It's also recommended by uh, American Association of Sleep Medicine to have some sort of additional measures such as ECG, breathing rate, and leg movements while having a polysomnography measurement. When it comes to the lab, we usually make use of high density EEG systems as a part of this PSG. Uh, but there are also some portable systems that can be mounted on the subjects and then they can be sent home to, to sleep in a more naturalistic environment. Sleep is not a uniform phenomenon and our brain activity cyclically alternates between various stages. Sleep usually starts with the transition uh, from wakefulness to the first phase of non-REM sleep, which is called N1, that comes with a low amplitude mixed frequency EG activity, the eyes are slowly moving from a side to another, and there is a decrease in muscle tone when compared to the wakefulness. Then uh, sleep is usually followed by N2 or a light sleep, which is how marked with these uh, fast activities called uh, spindles, and the slow and high amplitude activities called K complexes. The deepest stage of sleep is N3 or slow wave sleep, that is characterized by the so called slow oscillations that show the global synchronous neural activity that alternate between the up states of uh, neuro, uh, neuronal depolarization and the down states of neuronal hyperpolarization. And uh, usually a sleep cycle ends with a part of rapid eye movement that has a wake-like EEG activity. The eyes are rapidly moving from a side to another and there is a muscle atonia. It's also worth mentioning that most our dreams are being generated in REM sleep. But what is a lucid dream? Lucid dreaming is defined as a state of awareness of the ongoing dream state while sleeping. It has several applications, such as in a clinical settings to threat nightmare, PTSD, narcolepsy. Also in cognitive neuroscience to compare the brain activity while performing a dream task and executing the same task during wakefulness. Also in sports to have some sort of virtual motor training during sleep that would influence the upcoming wakefulness, the, the performance during upcoming wakefulness, and also recreational applications such as uh, enhancing creativity or having an immersive self-directed representation. Lucid dreaming is a rather rare phenomenon. However, it can be learned and trained. Therefore, various studies have proposed different techniques to induce lucid dreams. And among them, we have, for instance, cognitive training such as autosuggestion or mild, or perceptual stimulations that are more technology-based, such as to play uh, any sort of light, audio, or vibration while the person is sleeping, or even to combine them. Uh, and in 2020, uh, Michel uh, combined uh, pre-sleep cognitive training together with light and audio stimulation during sleep. Uh, and you see an illustration of this study here, and this ended up in a relatively high and successful rates of lucidity induction. But why do we still need to study lucid dreaming induction? What are the current limitations that we have and how can we address them by defining a new study? The first problem is that most studies to date lacked physiological measurements and were, uh, were merely limited to self-reported questionnaires. One important reason for that is the complexities regarding polysomnography because it's usually a bucky system and thus confined to the lab environment. It's also costly, effortful, and uh, it's not the best choice to have to recruit several subject, subjects based on this system. The other problem is that uh, in the case of uh, including physiological measurements, the generalizability of uh, the studies was limited to exclusive recruitment of experienced lucid dreamers. 
even though we know that when we talk about induction, we need to more target the uh, sort of naive participants. And last but not least, uh, only a few studies attempted to reliably induce lucid dreams in naive participants, but those were also limited to a rather small sample sizes and have not yet been replicated. But what is the solution? How can we overcome these limitations? Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is to simplify the measurement modality. Thanks to the current developments in the field of electronics and AI, we have now different variables in the market by which we can track sleep. And among them, EEG variables attracted the most attention because basically EEG is the most prominent to, uh, to EEG is the most prominent signal to study sleep. And when these systems are combined with uh, AI, we can even think of uh, automating many processes. Now that we have a simplified measurement modality, we can think of enhancing the generalizability because now these systems are uh, more accessible in different labs worldwide. So we can think of uh, including different uh, laboratories worldwide and target larger uh, scale of participants, especially those who are naive. So based on that, we defined our solution by making use of ZMAX headband that has two frontal EEG channels, the ones you see inside. And it also has the reference and ground also frontally and in the middle. In addition to the EEG, it has an accelerometer uh, to measure movement, a PPG sensor to measure heart rate variability, a microphone to record noise, ambient noise or snoring, an ambient light sensor and a thermometer. But on top of these features, uh, ZMAX is capable of uh, transmitting data in real time with a PC. So with this small Bluetooth dongle, data is uh, transmitted to computer in real time and that means that we are not limited to the electronics we have on the headband to perform any analysis, but we can uh, make use of the resources we have on a PC. So it really helps us to perform uh, more expensive computational tasks. And also it's open source, which means that it gives the possibility to the developers and researchers to build up on the existing features of CMAX and come up with a software that uh, kind of affords their needs. Now that uh, we defined a simplified uh, measurement modality, what other prerequisites do we have to run a large scale lucid dream study? The first thing is to have a software that meets our requirements so as to uh, record it the way we want to, to let us monitor the data and uh, stimulate in a way we want. And also we, we need a structured protocol because uh, when we talk about uh, generalizability, it should be uh, replicable, which means that the protocol should be some, somehow strict so that any researcher at any part of the world can just follow that and do the exact same thing. Let's start with the software. Uh, we need a software that uh, not only shows us the data in real time, but gives us the navigation feature because most softwares that we have to date are just limiting the experimenter to the current window. But imagine that something happens a few seconds ago that needs verification. And in most these softwares, it's not possible to go back and confirm what just happened. Also the software needs to give us a, like an interactive graphical user interfa interface for a sensory stimulation. So as to uh, that the experimenter should be able to easily like configure the stimulus properties and then present it in an easy manner. Also, once an important uh, happening occurs, the experimenter should be able to uh, mark that desired annotation. And given that uh, most variables, just like ZMAX, are making use of non-conventional EEG montages, which are a bit different from polysomnography due to having this uh, reference frontally, the shape of oscillations we see in them is a bit different from normal PSG. That's why uh, we need the software that uh, helps us uh, with providing some supplementary information, such as real-time auto scoring, power spectrum analysis, and TFR, such that the experimenter can interpret the data easier. Having these requirements and knowing the fact that uh, they didn't exist in uh, the um, current software packages, 
we decided to create our own um, toolbox and that ended up in developing the first open source dream engineering toolbox, which is called Dreamento. If you're interested in uh, reading all the details about it, please have a look uh, at our uh, archive preprint. But in the upcoming slides, I'm going to focus on the most prominent features of Dreamento. In real time, Dreamento is capable of recording, monitoring, analyzing, and stimulating data in, a, in an interactive user interface. But once the data is collected, uh, it doesn't leave you alone. It also helps with the post-processing of the resulting data. So let's focus on the features we have in Dreamento. Uh, for that, I split the main window of uh, real-time Dreamento into three uh, sub-panels, A to C. And now we're going to focus on each. Starting by A, uh, we have the recording and stimulation panel. So given that in uh, many studies, um, I already mentioned that ZMAX has several sensors, but it might be the case that the researchers are not interested in uh, recording all the available information due to the storage problems or whatever else. So we gave the possibility in here to um, select a subsection of data to be recorded. And also the real-time auto-scoring panel is here. The, the default uh, method we use is a stack of convolutional neural network and a long short-term memory. But we're currently working on enhancing this method and also uh, develop, developing uh, some new methods that work even better. As for the stimulation, uh, let's start by light stimulation. ZMAX has uh, two LEDs that are located frontally. And to apply the stimulus, you need to first select a desired color. For that, we included this red, green, and blue components that the researcher can uh, just play around with them and come up with a desired color of interest. And then uh, that light is selected. After that, the rest of properties uh, include the number of repetitions or how many blinks do we want as a, a light stimuli, whether we want them to apply simultaneously or alternatively, because there are two actually, also the on and off times of each blink. And of course the, the intensity or brightness. So once these uh, properties are set, one can click on the visual uh, button and then the light stimulus will be presented. Then we have the audio stimulation. For the audio stimulation, one can either load the pre-recorded audio here and then by hitting the audio button, it will be presented. But we also thought of uh, dream communication studies or something like the two-way communication study that uh, Karen and colleagues were doing. So we included this text-to-speech feature that one can write down any letter, word, or sentence, whatever. And then by hitting this text-to-speech, this will be converted into audio and will be presented for the dreamer. And as the last type of stimulus, we have the uh, vibration that can either be accompanied with the light stimulation or alone. So once all the lights are set to zero, it's just vibration. But once a color is selected, it's accompanied with vibration. And in here, one can uh, just set a, uh, set a marker once uh, something important happens. And this uh, stores the exact timestamp of that happening. The next panel I would like to talk about is the analysis panel. So at the end of each uh, 30 seconds of epoch, Dreamento provides the user with a prediction of the uh, sleep stage, in addition to a power spectral density that shows the power distribution uh, within different frequency bands and also a time frequency representation. And finally, in the panel C, we have the real time data representation that shows the two uh, EEG channels in real time with adjustable uh, time and amplitude axis. But importantly, it also has the, um, the navigation feature. So uh, just to take it as an example, we see that the experimenter is now seeing from second 20 to 25. But imagine something happened around here, around second 15. And uh, uh, the, the experimenter is not sure. So with Dreamento, we gave the possibility to navigate and go back in the current epoch and just verify what happened in here, which I guess plays an essential role in uh, lucid dreaming studies. 
Uh, now let's talk about the post-processing dream mental. Uh, in post-processing the dream mental, I mean, when the data is collected and we want to uh, post-process it offline, we integrate whatever information that we collected by ZMAX, including uh, EEG, uh, ambient noise, whatever you want, basically. And then uh, we also add the analysis results like the offline uh, auto scoring, uh, time frequency representations. And it's also possible to um, integrate a parallel recording because we know that in most uh, lucid dreaming studies, EMD is a prominent signal, but uh, with ZMAX, it's not possible to uh, record EMG. That's why uh, we need a, another device to measure EMG and then uh, with Dreamental, we can synchronize the EMG with the EEG and then uh, integrate it in the one window. And that's what we get. Again, to have a better representation, uh, let's split it into different panels, starting by panel A that shows the overall recording. So this is the whole duration of the recording. In panel A1, we have all the markers. So uh, the experimenter knows the exact timestamp of each marker and each has a specific color and number then in a2 we have the stimuli so uh, again the exact timestamps of each and uh, different colors red is for visual uh, stimulation green is for vibration and blue is for auditory and finally the time frequency representation if you look at here uh, we have a vertical black line that shows uh, the current epoch or the selected epoch because uh, from panels B onwards, whatever we show belongs to this selected epoch. In panel B1 and 2, we see the exact same information as A1 and A2, with the difference that these belong to the current epoch, so the one selected by this line. In a B3, we see the output of the acceleration accelerometer. So we see the XYZ components of acceleration, which uh, can be useful uh, either for detecting the, the orientation of movement or orientation of the head when the subject is uh, still. And in this case, uh, there is no movement because the subject was sleeping. In B4, we see the ambient noise. Again, given that the subject was sleeping, there was no ambient noise and uh, he was not snoring. We see a relatively flat line. In panel C, we see the EMG recordings because, uh, yeah, as I mentioned here, we have a parallel recording and with Remento now, we um, synchronized it to the EEG recordings. The EEG of the current channel and the TFR and eventually the markers. Now that we have a, a complete representation of this uh, channel, uh, this uh, display, let's see what we have. So it was a period of uh, lucid dreaming that at this point, the subject performed the left, right, left, right eye movement. Then after a few seconds, the experimenter uh, set this marker number 18, which says that LRL are detected. After a few seconds, the light stimulus is played, which was responded by another left, right, left, right of the dreamer, another uh, marker that is left, right, left, right detected, and then it goes on. So with Dremento, uh, we also try to uh, provide a complete list of documentations, which will be hopefully useful for both the end users and developers, because we don't want to limit ourselves to the existing features of Dremento, but we want other uh, researchers to collaborate with us and just build up on that. And that's why we try to have a clear description of each of the classes, methods, and so on. And we also have a how-to page from uh, how to install the Dreamento to how to start a recording with it and how to post-process it. So with all that, uh, we think that now we have a software that meets our requirements. And now it's time to go to the next prerequisite that we had, which was the structured protocol. Uh, this protocol is uh, pre-registered on Open Science Framework. So if you're interested in uh, reading all the details about it, please have a look, uh, either this link or the QR code. But uh, I'm going to describe the most prominent parts of it. The main objective that we have in this uh, lucid dreaming induction study 
is to introduce a reliable, minimal, and uh, flexible method to induce lucid dreams with variables. But we also want to validate the performance of Dream and Two as an all-in-one package to record, monitor, analyze, and stimulate sleep. Uh, but this study will also serve as a kind of preparation for a next phase, which will be a fully automatic lucid dream induction study at home that, uh, yeah, we try to make use of the data we collect in this phase to uh, automate the, the process of um, lucid dream induction in a more smart way. Uh, the hypothesis we have in here is that, or let's say the, the induction method that we use is a combination of uh, pre-sleep cognitive training, which, which is sense-initiated lucid dreaming, that we want to pair it with uh, sensory cues in a targeted lucidity reactivation manner. And we think that once these are played during REM sleep, this would lead to lucid dream induction. Uh, for those who might not be familiar with sense-initiated lucid dreaming, uh, it has always these cycles of vision, hearing, and bodily sensation trainings. It starts by the vision training during which the subject should uh, keep the eyes closed and all the attention should be focused on the darkness behind the eyes. The subject doesn't have to imagine something and just needs to uh, like observe everything in a passive and relaxed manner. When it comes to hearing exercise, all the attention should be on the ears. Again, they don't have to uh, try to hear something specific. They can hear something uh, either externally like the sound of traffic or internally like the ringing in the ears. But again, everything should be in a passive and relaxed manner. And a cycle of uh, sense initiated lucid dreaming is ended by bodily sensation exercises during which all the attentions on, on are on the sensations from the body, like something external, like the weight of the blanket or something internal, like the tingling, heaviness, lightness. And again, all observations should be done in a passive manner. So uh, let's get into the design of this study. With this study, we try to overcome the existing limitations in the current lucid dreaming literature. And that's why we designed a multi-center study with uh, including three labs in the Netherlands, Canada, and Italy with the aim of recruiting uh, 60 subjects overall that they should have at least one uh, lucid dreaming experience and a proper dream recall. Um, and this would be hopefully the largest sample size for a lucid dreaming induction study with physiological measurements. Um, regarding the study design, uh, we start by an intake session during which we get different questionnaires on sleep, dreaming, and mood. After that, for a week, the subjects should uh, fill in uh, dream diaries, lucidity questionnaires, and sleep with Fitbit at home. After that, they come for the first nap session. Then we have another week of uh, completing dream diaries and lucidity questionnaires, and finally the second nap session. And these two nap sessions are served as a stimulus and control, uh, stimulation and control in a counterbalanced manner. So during uh, both stimulation and control, we have exact the same procedure uh, during wakefulness, which starts by SSILD, and then uh, it will be combined with targeted lucidity reactivation. After that, the subjects are allowed to fall asleep. Often the detection of REM sleep uh, during the stimulation session, uh, we play some sensory cues, but that's not the case during the control session. And after that, the subject will be awakened and a dream report will be taken. So uh, with all this, uh, we also aim for the next phase of the study, which is uh, to go towards a reliable and fully automatic lucid dream induction at home but we still have some uh, points that we need to work on, some points of improvement, including the auto-scoring, because most auto-scoring algorithms that exist are uh, for offline scoring. And um, even most of them uh, are based on polysomnography, not uh, variables like ZMAX. And when it comes to online scoring, we have a challenge there because uh, we have uh, some uh, computational limitations like, such as time, and the computational costs that the algorithm should take. 
Uh, we also think of higher frequency of scoring. So rather than scoring every 30 seconds, uh, we want to score every five seconds or so to be closer to, to the real time. And uh, to have an automatic approach, we also need to develop a smart approach to detect arousals in real time, based on which we can adaptively modify the stimulus properties. But uh, we don't want to limit ourselves to the lucid dreaming induction. Uh, indeed, our main aim is lucid dreaming. But we think that uh, the applications of Dreamento can be extended to other fields, such as a targeted memory re reactivation and auditory stimulation. And uh, yeah, hopefully in future, uh, we can also make use of it in other fields. So with that, I would like to uh, thank Amir. Uh, he was uh, actively involved in the process of uh, coding Dreamento. And he recently started his uh, PhD studies at the John Hopkins. So good luck, Amir. Also, thanks to uh, Michelle, uh, Claudia, Leila, and Emma for helping with uh, preparing this uh, nice pre-registration. Thanks to Tinka for help helping with the experiments and the data collection. And of course, to Freddy, Sarah, and Martin for their uh, supervision and support. And of course, thank to you for uh, listening to me. And I hope you found this uh, useful. Thank you so much. Hi, so yeah, thanks again, Mahad. That was great. Um, yeah, really good overview of Dramento and the study coming up. And I already see some good uh, questions uh, flowing into the chat here. So I think that could be a, a good place for us to start. But yeah, first of all, thank you for the uh, the presentation there. That was great. Thank you so much. Yeah, so let's just go into the, the chat. I think we can just kind of go in order here. Um, so I'll give people the chance to voice over their, their question if they want. If not, I'll just read it in the chat, you know. Um, so first one's uh, Rahul, if you want to ask your question about uh, EMG sensing. All right. Um, so I'll just ask this one. Uh, he's just wondering uh, which device to use to record uh, the, the EMG measurements for this. Yeah, this phase of the study is in a lab, so we don't use a variable for EMG recording. It's just a brain and EXG system. But uh, in the future and for home study, we need to actually it depends on the performance of Trimento in uh, detecting REM in real time, because uh, depending on whether we can detect REM with a reliability without any EMG signal, we may completely exclude it. But if we want to include it, we need a variable system for that. But at the moment, it's not variable. Yeah. It makes sense. I imagine a lot of people at that at home study would prefer not to wear electrodes on their chins if they don't if they don't absolutely have to. Um, all right, next one is Brian Lee. Do you want to ask your uh, question? Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, yeah, one of my questions were, um, you mentioned that uh, there's a dongle that's uh, necessary for data transmission, and I was wondering if that was uh, for Bluetooth 2.0, or are you guys using Bluetooth LE or some kind of custom wireless radio? What is underneath the, the dongle um, if your computer has built-in Bluetooth uh, already? Yeah, actually, this Bluetooth dongle, uh, I'm not sure if you see it. But uh, it comes uh, with a commercial device, and uh, they keep it as kind of a black box. They say it has a Bluetooth Wi-Fi uh, like protocol, so we don't exactly know what, what does it do. But for sure, it's not only Bluetooth. Otherwise, we could just use uh, the Bluetooth of the computer. OK. Um, another kind of follow-up question uh, actually would be, um, so I guess that would mean that uh, if it's not pure Bluetooth 2.0 or LED 4 or 5 communication, that uh, the protocol that is used to transmit the data would work with um, common wireless devices like uh, Android and uh, iPad, things like that. Um, so those mobile devices won't be able to work with the ZMAX currently because of that dongle. Uh, actually, uh, I personally never worked with Android, but uh, if you visit their website, they also have an application for Android. So I don't know if they use the exact same uh, dongle or they have like a connection to make it work. 
but they also have Android version, so it should be possible to use it also for Android. For Android, okay. And lastly, um, can you give more information on the bit depth, bit rate, and um, of the signal for the ENG, e, uh, for the EEG? Oh, um, yeah, uh, how many bits and uh, what the sampling rate is? Uh, sorry, I, I'm not sure if I got your question. What is the bit rate or sample rate for the EEG, the raw EEG, and what is the bit depth? Yeah, for both it's 256. Okay, 256 for a sample rate. And is this um, 6 bit, 24 yeah. bit, 16? Yeah, 16 bits, yeah. If I'm not mistaken, 16, yeah. Okay, and the last one is, uh, as far as external EMG devices, is this synchronized through LSL or some other, uh, how is it exactly synchronized to timestamps? Uh, yeah, we asked the participants to uh, perform some tasks which are visible on both EMG and EEG, and that's basically clenching the teeth because it makes a very uh, high frequency noise on both EEG and EMG. And then uh, with Dremento, we have like a cross correlation uh, algorithm that can uh, sync them. Okay. Um, so it's a custom protocol, which is thinking, doing time synchronization between EEG and EMG then. Do you know if it supports LSL? Uh, LSL, I don't know what you mean by LSL. Lab streaming layer? The yeah, software. I don't know, unfortunately, yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Right, cool. Thanks for the good questions, Brian. Um, ne next one's up. Uh, I see Ryan here. He has a question about um, text-to-speech uh, for two-way communication. And just just like Brian, I have a couple of follow-ups too, but they're not as, as good as his. Uh, so I was asking about the text-to-speech voice that you're using. I, I assume, is that open source? And are you using maybe more than one of them? Or are you able to modulate the volume on it so as to not startle a subject? And then I'm also curious if you get to a point where you are doing home studies, are those going to be able to be monitored remotely over the internet or is the data just gonna to have to be collected in at the person's home and then sent somewhere? Yeah, good questions. Uh, for the text-to-speech, we are using an open source uh, like package. So we didn't uh, create it, we, we are just making use of that. And uh, to control the volume, we are just making use uh, of the, the audio system of the computer basically. And uh, for the home recordings, um, again, ZMAX has a, a system by which we can uh, connect uh, like uh, remotely to, the, uh, to a PC with which ZMAX is transmitting data, but uh, we don't want to make life that complicated. So we think of having uh, like some uh, surface tablets that have relatively high computational power. And then uh, with a remote access, like SSH tunnel or something, we can access it remotely. That's cool. So you guys are planning to do remote monitoring because that's something that, yeah. you know, that we're going to be trying to do. So that, that's actually kind of cool. Yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, next up, I see uh, Nathan's question about exclusion criteria. Yeah, so I was just curious because I was like looking at your pre-registration and like I was just curious, like, it looks like you were like excluding people with like high anxiety and prodromal schizophrenia and who didn't have like have a history of lucid dreams. I was just curious kind of like why that was. Uh, yeah, that's basically uh, more about our uh, ethics approval that we need to work with healthy participants and uh, basically uh, anyone who uh, like passes those limitations is not counted as healthy and that's the only reason. Makes sense. I guess like the other thing I was wondering about is so I guess I think like probably about like 50% of adults have never had a lucid dream and just kind of I'm I'm curious like if you're excluding those people kind of are you looking at a non representative population? Well you, you are looking at a non-representative population but I'm curious kind of like would it work differently in those people? Like maybe it works a lot better in people who just never have lucid dreams. Uh, yes, actually. Um, the reason that we included this at least one lucid dreaming in life and the proper dream recall is that uh, during the pilot studies, we did not have any condition based on lucid dreaming. 
And sometimes we uh, work the subjects up and then uh, they didn't have anything to report. But uh, with these criteria, we just try to give, our, give ourselves more chance to have uh, some more dream reports and uh, some more experience of the subject. But that more than one lucid dream per life doesn't mean that they are lucid dreaming every day. We are still aiming for uh, like a minority of these experience, like just one lucid dream in life or once a year, something really minor. All right, nice, good questions, uh, Nathan. Um, next up, I see Manuel in the chat um, asking about other kind of hardware device compatibility. Um, uh, so Manuel, I don't know if you want to voice over that question a bit more. If not, I can just, I'll, I'll just read it verbatim. Um, so, you know, he says, uh, will affordable EEG wearables become compatible with Dramento, like enchanted wave headbands, et cetera? Because the, the Z Max is about a thousand dollars USD. Um, let me find the question. Sorry. Yeah, that's it. I'll oh, just yeah, um, yeah, yeah, you get it. Yeah. Uh, regarding compatibility, basically, uh, we are using uh, BrainM EXT uh, in addition to Z Max, and uh, that's why we, uh, our Current Dreamento is capable of reading the output from BrainApp, but uh, I guess um, the open source Python codes are available to read out from any sort of uh, device, either wearable or non-wearable. So as long as uh, one can read the data and feed it into Dreamento, the rest of the processes like the analysis, the, the synchronization and all these should remain the same. So it's just about reading the data. Um, which means that if someone is going to use a device that uh, Dream the current version of Dreamento is not able to read it, it's just, uh, it's just uh, simple coding to read that, that data and then the rest will remain the same. Yes, um, it looks like we got, and yeah, now that's obviously uh, great to, uh help with greater compatibility in the future. And I see um, Bill has, you know, kind of a related question. I don't know if that um, totally addressed your question, Bill, about other device compatibility, but I see you also have a, a comment about another kind of similar project. Yeah, no, first of all, I just wanted to applaud the work, Mahad. It's, it's really, really great to see this going on. Yeah, the, the one thing I wanted to put on your radar and also ask about, so I, the, you did sort of answer the question, which was what the plans might be to support um, you know, other hardware going forward or other peripherals and things like, for instance, maybe you wanted to bring in, um, you know, a different biometric channel of information separate, you know, like, and still uses Emacs, for instance. So, so the, the project I was, I had posted was something called Micromanager, which was a kind of a game changer in the, um, in the, in the biological sciences. And it allowed these high-end research microscopes um, you know, which which are controlled by software uh, to to uh, to kind of come under the same tent. So you, I just so I wanted to point, just put that on your radar. I think it's like several steps ahead of where you you are or even need to be right now. But um, it, it is a super a super powerful way of of bringing in, I think, a lot of different research. That that's in any event what I'm super excited about seeing how this unfolds because I think that's kind of been the missing link. So. Um, look forward to seeing how it all moves forward. Thank you. All right. Yeah, good. Good stuff, Bill. Um, and good to see you again. I see him on my street once in a while here in San Francisco. Um, so another question we got, uh, uh, Lori asking about um, going beyond light and sound and things like magnetic stimulation and other kind of stimulation modalities in the future. Um, feel free to layer on more to that, Lori, if that doesn't cover it. Uh, you're on there mute. it is there hey, it uh, is. good to see you <laughs> good to see you too Magda, thank you so much for the presentation and good to see you again um yeah i mean that's basically my question i'm curious you know i know you're working on a lot of different projects so even beyond Remento, like if you know whether it's something you're working on or anyone else is working on i'm just curious about people who are looking at brain stimulation as a part of the eeg wearable world 
Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not really aware of uh, other works. Uh, I just know that um, there are some, uh, there will be some FNIRs uh, with wearables. Uh, they, they will start working on that in near future in our lab, maybe uh, in the middle of next year or so. But that's not, that's not something that I am directly involved in. Um, and the reason that we selected these three uh, types of stimulation, light, audio, and vibration, is basically the sensors that we had in uh, ZMAX. But in case someone is uh, making use of a wearable system that has those sensors involved, maybe with uh, some minor changes, these can be also integrated. Is it is it discussed at all as a goal, like, or a way of the future, or not at the moment? Or... No. Okay, thanks. Yeah, good question. I was also curious about that one. Um, I see Dr. Leslie next in the queue asking about uh, collaborators in uh, in Canada. Uh, yes, we have Michelle and also Claudia. They're both here. So what was oh, the question? Oh, I guess I'm just curious what lab you're collaborating with in Canada. Okay, good question, but I guess Claudia and Michelle can uh, respond better than me, if they're there. Yeah, it's, uh, well, Michelle Carr will be working in, uh, in Canada, in Montreal. We're at the, uh, yeah, center, like, uh, it's a research center on sleep medicine that we're part of. And so I'll you're here with Tori Nielsen? I'm currently with Tori Nielsen, but next year yeah uh, michelle is uh, just uh, we'll start our own lab there yeah oh yes okay <laughs> very nice the magic of the event uh the the people that are collaborating with are actually on the call <laughs> so that's great <laughs> um all right and, and yeah just kind of reading down the queue i saw laura had one about um you know what would, would uh the exclusion criteria of healthy people also exclude people on the autism uh, spectrum as part of the exclusion criteria. Yeah. I don't know, I don't know if Laura is still on, um, but I think that that question is pretty. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Um, yeah, I was just curious because it's it's not um, autism is like contingent to mental illnesses, but it's it's like hard to classify it. So I can see why why you might choose to exclude um autistic people at this time because it's very pro preliminary and like they, the the neurology of autism is not like fully studied especially with like how it affects sleep and so forth nice good um yeah good good to bring that up um when i'm going through the queue i think we've exhausted all of the questions in the queue um but want to give people to uh if there's any other questions that aren't covered in there, um, feel free to like raise your hand and we can go to you. If not, I can fire off a few final questions. Any any burning questions not captured in the chat? I see Brian Lee has his hand raised. So maybe we start there. Uh, I was wondering, uh, in Mento, uh, first of all, for the ZMAX device, um, is it sending the pure PBG data? And also, is it able, is Dramento, uh, does it have built-in algorithms uh, from the PPG signal to uh, calculate BPM and IBIs for um, HRV during, the, uh, during that session for each one of those epochs? Uh, CMAX itself has an algorithm by which uh, they calculate BPMs, uh, they take it out from the PPG signal, but we are also thinking of uh, having kind of an alternative auto scoring system because for the nights or for the for any recording uh, in which we lose the EG, EG signals, we still almost always have the PPG and acceleration. So uh, we are starting to also work on an auto scoring uh, just based on PPG and acceleration. Regarding the um, uh, PPG um, outside of uh, BPM, is it, is it also um, able to calculate um, RR intervals or IBI? 
I don't think so. It, it just gives you like a number beats per minute, but um, yeah, I don't think it has any information about R to R intervals. Yeah. There's no access to the raw waveform? Uh, there, there is access to, to the raw signal. Yeah, there is an access. So this BPM is a kind of a post-processing that we get out of it, but the raw signal is also there. Thank you. Nice. And being a, an, an employee of uh, Aura, it'd be a miss for me to not mention, you can get a lot from the, the PPG signal on a, on a wearable device for, uh, you know, you can't measure brain waves from it, but a lot of, you know, good measurements that correlate with sleep stages. Um, I, I see Link has his hand raised, so let's go to him next. Uh, yeah, hey. Um, yeah, thanks, Brian, for organizing as always. And uh, my dad, thanks for your presentation. Um, just wondering, I guess, um, more general speaking, since you're like, you know, um, building something very specific, uh, which is great. What's sort of your um, take on like, what do you think are some problems like that the industry is facing in general? Um, because like, you know, this is very young, obviously, like, you know, the technology is very nascent. And so um, it's like, from your perspective, like, what do you see some obstacles? What problems are you facing? You know, um, that we know what sort of helped your research. Yeah, uh, I would say uh, for the headbands that they have like uh, onboard um, calculation and onboard um, um, systems, uh, we have a limitation that we have a really limited uh, computational cost. But when with something like ZMAX, again, we need a computer, which is again too much. So I guess the best approach is to have kind of a cloud computing. So uh, I guess the best approach for the variables is to target uh, cloud computing. And then um, just, it's about how to transmit the data to cloud, how often, how to take care of the battery and so on. But I, I still think ZMAX doesn't have the best approach because it's always dependent on a computer for uh, any usage like this. Nice, but a good, good place to start when there's processing limitations on device. So at least you can kind of learn in the, in the near, near term phases here. Um, I see Prakash has his hand up. So let's go to, to him next. And thanks uh, for thank you, it was a very nice presentations and talk. I have one, um, uh, I have one uh, basic question in which I wanted to see that uh, when you do a auto scoring of uh, sleep, uh, uh, is there any time constraint that you should be uh, for a new data set, uh, it, it, does it need to be more than a specific number of hours? Because I was once having a talk and they said that you need to have at least three hours. Uh, second is like, and how does uh, EEG uh, sleep scoring compare with the HRV sleep scoring? Like what is the, uh, because actually I was doing some basic studies and I actually saw discrepancy, you know, like, uh, HRV giving a different hypnogram and the EEG giving a different hypnogram and uh, just any thoughts on that. Yeah, but your first question, uh, that's actually the internal algorithm of ZMAX that you're talking about, uh, which is dependent on these uh, first three hours of recording. And then again, it's a black box for us, so we don't know what, what's really happening. But what, what they say is that uh, it needs to record three hours of sleep that, uh, that to be able to like detect RAM more reliably. And after that, it's capable of stimulating during RAM. But all that is a part of a ZMAX protocol and just a black box for us. And I don't know the details about. And uh, regarding your second question, that's actually a part of, uh, one, of one other study of mine that, in which we are trying to validate the performance of this ZMAX with respect to polysomnography. And we also have Fitbit involved. And in Fitbit, we use uh, mostly PPG signal, and we are going to compare the auto scoring. Uh, at the moment, I can't give you a, an, a very exact answer, but uh, I would say EEG is the most uh, prominent signal to say sleep. So based on that, this should work better. Yeah, based on EEG auto scoring. Yeah. I was really Just curious, um, how do you get the raw PPG out of the Fitbit? No, that's really difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so you're just using the BPM or? 
Yeah, we are just using the internal auto scoring of a Fitbit. So we are not developing any algorithm for Fitbit. We're just- Oh, I see, yeah. yeah. All right, so very good questions all around. I see um, maybe Brian Lee has a, a final question here. Is that a new hand raise? All right, yeah, go for it. Um, with that being said, what about the, would you be able to also synchronize then um, with an ex existing open source uh, heart rate monitor then outside of the, I guess you the PPG built into ZMAX, but what if you had like a, uh, Wahoo Fitness ticker or something like that, a chest strap, which was uh, Bluetooth LE, where you can get that IVI data, would you be able to synchronize that with Pimento then in order to um, get all that on the same graph? That's my final question. Yeah, I guess that should be possible if we can uh, trigger all the devices that are recording simultaneously at the same time step. So if we have a kind of trigger button or any sort of action that shows up in all the signals, that's possible. But at the moment, nothing really comes to my mind. Thank you. And thank you again for your presentation. Yeah, you're welcome. And thanks, Brian, for coming with a lot of, lot of good questions. Those are all, yeah, definitely on point. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll close with uh, a few kind of just like general forward-looking questions. Um, and again, before that, you know, thanks for uh, being generous with your time and joining us, uh, in, you know, from the nighttime in the Netherlands across the ocean here, at least for some of us, I think we got a mix of people across the world here. Um, but yeah, thanks again for that. And I want to, um, you know, close with a question that's more forward-looking. You know, if you think ahead to, let's call it two to three years from now, like what would be your kind of vision of success for this open source kind of software like Dramento um, and then also kind of extending it to this phase two of the study. I'm very curious, you know, like that could play out multiple ways, you know, probably not sure in, until you do the phase one of the study, but what would your be kind of ideal outcome for both this Dramento software, you know, whether it's getting adopted broadly or functionality, and then um, as far as that phase two of the study. Yeah, uh, regarding the phase two, we already uh, received lots of interest from different labs that they want to collaborate which actually gives us the possibility to kind of have a very, um, let's say comprehensive comparison between different induction methods. So we just don't, we don't want to say the method that we are using at the moment is the best. We just want to compare it. And um, in the second phase, we don't have many limitations that we currently have, like the number of participants, like the lab usage and so on. Uh, so we are thinking of uh, defining different protocols, different approaches to induce lucid dreams, not necessarily novel ones, but from the existing literature, and then uh, assign each lab just to uh, have one of these uh, out of the basket, and then have a comparison between the outputs. And uh, regarding Dreamento itself, um, I hope um, with, with this study, with the first phase that also works kind of as a validation and ben benchmarking of the uh, whole package, uh, we are successful and we show that it works and then it can even uh, attract more attention. Uh, one important uh, note about Dreamento is that um, anyone can make use of it, even though for now, we just limited it to ZMAX recordings, but basically uh, in any way that one can read the data in real time in Python, can feed it into Dreamento and then can just benefit from its outputs. So what we develop is not just for ZMAX, but anyone who has a part of code that works with real time uh, data transmission can uh, do some changes and make use of it. So with that, I hope we have a wide and uh, bright future yeah nice yeah no, that's great and again thanks again and i've never felt brighter about the future of you know lucid dreaming and tech applied to lucid dreaming i think lucid dreaming has profound potential to improve you know it's like some of the things you talked about uh, earlier in your presentation from nightmares to p you know ptsd to self-exploration to exploring the nature of reality who knows like the bounds like we don't even know like where this could go but i think it has you know profound positive potential and these kind of tools can help us get it more accessible to more people and it still feels like you know very early days a lot of degrees of freedom and kind of uncertainty but that's where a lot of the fun is uh, to explore and you know better understand this space so appreciate 
you know, the work that you and your lab are doing and all the various collaborators and, you know, thanks again for uh, uh, the, the presentation today. That was, that was great. Yeah, it was a pleasure for me. Thank you for arranging all this session. Thanks.